I am delighted to introduce our guest speaker, Eli Kirsch, who is a certified lake manager, licensed agricultural PCA in California, and owner of Lake Tech, Inc. Eli's consulting firm, Lake Tech, Inc., specializes in the management of lakes, canals, and reservoirs. He has worked in the aquatic plant management industry as an applicator and as a manufacturer's technical representative. He received his undergraduate degree from UC Santa Barbara, where he majored in geographic information science, GIS, and he obtained a master's degree in limnology with an emphasis in vegetation management from Cal State East Bay. Eli completed his thesis on the eutrophication of lakes and aquatic vegetation management. He's served five terms on the board of directors for the California Weed Science Society and has served as the president of the California Lake Management Society for three years. Eli is a certified lake manager by the North American Lake Management Society, where he currently serves on their board as a regional director. And today, Eli will be discussing various aspects of aquatic IPM and how understanding the fundamentals of aquatic ecology can be used to combat pests. Take it away, Eli. Well, that was quite the intro. Uh, it's almost as though I wrote it myself. I, uh, I sh it's a, a little, uh, a little pompous. I think I'll slim it down for the next one. Uh, thank you for the intro, <clears throat> for being willing to read all that. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm Eli Kirsch. I'm excited to be here. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to do. Um, that's listen to myself speak. Uh, that is actually. Uh, and I get the added benefit of also being able to see myself speak now. Uh, no, I actually, education is one of like our core values as a company and um, educating people about lakes. Um, there are some really simple fundamental rules that we like to teach people. And I think it really changes, um, really changes people's uh, expectations of what to do. Um, do we want to make an announcement to remind folks to mute yourselves? Please. It sounds like somebody's got their phone in their pocket, maybe. <laughs> but I get that. I've spent plenty of Zoom meetings while also trying to work. So um, again, yeah, Eli Kirsch. I run a company called Lake Tech. You may recall we rebranded. We used to be eLimnology. Um, and we rebranded this year because um, no one knows how to spell the word limnology and knows what it means. So I'll just give you a quick um, a quick rundown. Limnology is what I studied in school. You could think of it quite simply as the oceanography of inland waters or fresh water. And there are lots of societies, uh, professional societies, and resources available. Um, and it's basically it's the study of inland water bodies, but that can include salt water bodies. The Bay, San Francisco Bay is kind of a straddles both estuaries, deltas, um, but primarily we focus on and we're known for our work in fresh water. So streams, rivers, but mostly reservoirs and ponds, um, lakes. And it's, um, it's really an interdisciplinary study because we really need to look at climate, geography, um weather patterns um and we look a lot of course at biological activity and species in the lakes um so there's a lot that goes into it and um we we opt there isn't usually a limnologist who can do it all so we often work in pretty big teams we have you know the entomologist who helps us with the insect problems and the phycologist who's really specializing in the algae um and uh, we all work together. And um, my business partner is a professional civil engineer. And that's also a really important component of limnology because in, uh, especially in California, um, we have highly constructed, modified water systems. Some We have more canals and conveyance water systems in California than anywhere else in the world. Um, hundreds and hundreds of miles of canals and aqueducts and pipes moving water around from reservoir to reservoir and ultimately to us. So a little visual of what this kind of looks like and how I think about lakes is thinking about the natural cycles of nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, where they come from, where they go, 
uh, how to get rid of them, um, and then all of the other um, environmental factors that all interact um, to cause the problems that we often are faced with. And more often than not, um, it's all driven by the base of the food chain and the chemical and physical um, phenomena that occur in nature that manipulate and influence nutrient cycling. So phosphorus is usually what you hear about. Nitrate, nitrogen are also really important and understanding how those, um, those nutrients, which basically feed the bottom of the food chain, um, how the management of these lakes can manipulate and change the nutrient inputs. Um, just a side note on that, most nutrients are just naturally there. We call it internal loading or internal recycling, some people call it. And even if you have the best managed lake and you don't have any runoff, um, nutrients enter from the atmosphere, they settle on the water from dust, pollen, ash from forest fires, you cannot eliminate nutrients adding entering your lake. Um, <clears throat> and then once they're in there, they settle to the bottom and then they tend to basically kind of recycle and get brought back into suspension over time. And we'll talk a lot about those processes because that really is the key to IPM. Um, so a little bit about my company, um, we, um, have built a online platform, which is specific to the management of water bodies. And as far as we know, we're the one of a kind platform that does this, um, that explicitly focuses on this. And the reason we built this is we saw a need for it in our work, but also in the industry overall because IPM is about record keeping and it's about evaluation. And a lot of times we would come across projects and accounts where people would say, well, I don't remember what we did last year, or I don't think it looked like this last year. Um, and that's not good enough for evaluation. Um, we really need good record keeping. We need centralized databases. The only way to manage something is to monitor it and the only way to monitor it is to keep good records. So this platform uh, we've built, which is specific to not just collecting water quality data, but photo albums, pictures, notes, um, putting marks on your graph of when you were there last, um, what you did when you were there. So doing field logs, keeping track of your chemicals, how much you used, when did you use it? How did you apply it? Um, did you install an aeration system? Did you put pond dye in there? How much did you use? Was it effective? Um, so that, what we have tried to do is build a platform for the general public to use that allows them to actually participate in an IPM program by providing the tools and kind of the, the, guide, the guides to keep them on track. Um, we do work with, any manufacturer of any type of equipment. So we do lots of buoys because as you'll see in the presentation, understanding some of these words that you're looking at on your screen probably make no sense to you right now. They will by the end, I promise. Um, but understanding that in a lake, unlike other places we manage, we're three-dimensional. Um, and we really need to understand how different parameters, different organisms, um, are utilizing that space three-dimensionally and what's what are the chemical and physical characteristics of that space three-dimensionally so monitoring and measuring whether it's collecting water samples um, or physically measuring things with monitoring equipment like you see here different sensors that look at oxygen or temperature algae um, ph um, there are lots and lots of things that can be measured i would argue at a minimum, every site should just be looking at oxygen and temperature. And you'll see a lot more about why that is in the presentation. So the first thing I will say is I spend a lot of time on the internet buying things, uh, you know, for work. And I see a lot of marketing material and advertisements. 
I would just like to thank Amazon really quick because I bought four 10 pound anchors and 400 line uh, feet of steel line for anchors and uh, Amazon delivered it for free. That was, I think the Amazon driver probably hates me now though, because that was a big box and it was heavy, but uh, I do a lot of, you know, going online and, and looking and researching things and products. People call me all the time and ask me, oh, I found this thing called Muckaway. Is Muckaway any good or Pond Clear, Eco Boost, Nature's Blend? And I have to go and research what in the heck is this stuff and make a determination on is it, you know, potentially snake oil? Um, is it barley <laughs> or is it is it something real? So uh, you will see these ads all the time, right? Before and after. Um, if you see this ad, there's a good chance that a marketing person put it together who uh, probably knows very little about lakes. Um, I see these a lot. And so if you see these ads, just remember, there is no silver bullet. And this applies to everything we manage, whether it's a roadway, a park, uh, a range and pasture land, natural open spaces, Management is not about, let me buy that one thing and do it and I'll never come back again. It is about persistence, vigilance, monitoring, patience, failure, <laughs> make to adapt and try again. And that site that you're managing changes and is dynamic too, both seasonally, over time. And so when you start seeing these ads about before and after, um, you know, Take it with a grain of salt. I will just mention that this ad, which I found uh, online, I don't even think that's the same lake in those two pictures. I really, like, if you look closely, like, I don't, that, that is, those are different places. So <laughs> be careful about that. So if there's one thing you guys learned from this talk today, uh, and if you're really interested in lakes and ponds, write this word down, eutrophication. Everything we will talk about today ultimately has to do with eutrophication. Eutrophication is a natural process. I mentioned in the beginning how um, nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen and other things, they will come into your pond whether you like it or not. They're, it is not, it is it is unavoidable. And so what eutrophication is, the, the definition is well-nourished, meaning nutrients, the addition of nutrients. And a good way to think about eutrophication is the aging process of a lake. The same way as a forest becomes old growth, right? It starts out as maybe grassland, and then it turns into shrubs and bushes, and then trees, and then bigger trees. And then finally, we get an old growth forest. Well, the same thing happens in lakes. The difference is we like old growth forests because they're beautiful and we can go hiking in them. Uh, but we don't like old growth lakes because they're green and they're gross and they smell. But that is naturally what happens to lakes. So eutrophication basically is a process whereby nutrients build up in a lake over time. And that can lead to increased growth rates, which adds sediment to the bottom of the pond. The pond becomes more shallow, becomes more warm, creates more growth. And remember, nutrients every year are building up more and more in the pond. So eventually, um, eventually, all ponds will fill in completely. Even Lake Tahoe, which is pristine, uh, in a granite basin at the top of a mountain, um, it might take millions of years, but it's going to turn into a meadow. Um, there are really only a couple exceptions on the planet to that rule uh, for very specific reasons. But you know, if you have a backyard pond or an urban pond or an irrigation pond, this process might be a decade or two. Uh, but in larger natural water bodies, you know, it could be hundreds, thousands of years, and in some cases, you know, millions of years. So I'll go through kind of this process of eutrophication real quick with some bullet points. Again, it's driven by excess nutrients. Think phosphorus primarily, 
is, is the key one we think about, especially in this region. Phosphorus is usually available in the, the limited supply, which means uh, once it's depleted, things don't really grow. So we call it the limiting nutrient, and it's really the focus of, of lake management in a lot of parts of the country, but especially here. Um, so once you get excess nutrients in the pond, what does excess mean? Obviously, it means a lot, um, but in your pond, you have bacteria, you have other organisms, microorganisms, things that are utilizing that phosphorus um, when it enters the pond. Once you exceed their capacity to consume that, uh, then that's excess. And when that happens, you get nuisance growths. And it's usually algae, but it can also be plants or floating plants or other, other organisms potentially as well. So once you have that excess amount of nutrients, you fuel excess growth beyond typically to the insects and the zooplankton's ability to eat the algae, right? There's just too much nutrients in the pond and you, you've overrun the food chain, essentially. You've taken it out of balance. So once that happens, you get this algae bloom or excessive plant growth. When we used to have winters, you know, 10 years ago and it got cold, which it never does anymore, <laughs> all these plants die off. Algae dies off. It still does happen in winter. Um, some places more, more predictably than others. All that dead matter sinks to the bottom of the pond. When it's down there, it starts decomposing and organisms start eating it and they consume oxygen as part of the metabolism of eating and decomposing. Well, once that oxygen gets depleted because there's so much excess stuff dying off, you get interesting chemical reactions at the bottom of the pond, which actually cause more phosphorus to be released from the dirt and releasing more nutrients. So as you can see here, we end up with a feedback loop. A once you get to that tipping point where there's too much nutrients in your pond, you get excess growth, which leads to the depletion of oxygen which leads to the release of even more nutrients. So any questions so far? That, that is, in a nutshell, eutrophication of a lake, whereby a lake fills in and becomes more nutrient rich and ages, gets older. Let's see, I don't see, I don't see any hands going up. So I'm gonna assume you're all experts in eutrophication now. Actually, Eli, there is yeah. one hand up now, ah, great. Chris. Hey, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm just curious if nitrogen is ever the, the limiting nutrient here in California. It can be, yes. Um, every, you know, every site is different. Um, and understanding the ratios of nitrogen to phosphorus is often um, when we're going to do management um, that Understanding the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus can also, we can we can typically predict what's going to grow. Is it going to be a cyanobacteria, a green algae, or whatever? So, yeah, um, it can be. Um, and that is often very local. Um, is there any nitrogen, is, is it, it's not, tip, not typically. Okay, and so you look at the ratio to get an idea of what's limiting then? Yeah, yeah, you definitely want to look at that ratio. It's that's always going to be yeah, which one is in the least supply uh, available, and and sometimes that um, gets pretty nuanced with you know well what's growing in the pond and what does that specific species need the most, and ultimately that's you know when we get into talking about IPM a little more after this kind of intro to fundamentals, um, you know when, when we do IPM we're thinking about the physiology of these critters. And what do they need in the environment and how do we manipulate that environment? So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. I won't get too into the nitrogen phosphorus ratio. Um, we'll call that part two. Maybe when I come back, we can dig, dive into some of the more technical side. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Good to see you, Chris. Um, so uh, speaking of the more technical side, um, one thing, um, I dislike about the, the study of many fields of, of science is they like to create 
fancy words for things we already have perfectly good words for. Um, so, for example, littoral zone. We call that a shoreline. Uh, but today we're going to call it a littoral zone. And why do we call it a littoral zone? Well, what it is, is it is basically the area in a pond or a lake where majority of things grow. And why is that? Well, you see another fancy word there, which is photic zone, euphotic zone. Some people call it the photic zone. Well, that's that's how deep into the water sunlight can penetrate. So if we look at the shape and the slope of a shoreline, where the sunlight stops being able to hit the sediment, that's the end of the littoral zone. It's usually around 10 feet deep but it depends on how deep the sunlight can penetrate. And it ex can extend out five feet into a lake, 500 feet out into a lake. And understanding that that littoral zone ultimately is gonna be where you're gonna be focusing a lot of your IPM efforts uh, and understanding how you might be able to manipulate the littoral zone uh, is, a, is an important component of IPM. We also have in here, as you can see, the limnetic zone, uh, which is basically where sunlight can penetrate but not touch the bottom. And then the benthic zone, some people might be familiar with that term, benthos, are uh, a term we use to describe the critters that live in the mud. Um, and so the benthic zone uh, rep represents um, basically what we call the bottom or the sludgy part or uh, the muck. Muck is a very common word I hear. Um, so again, you know, fancy words for things we already have perfectly good words for. It's the benthic zone is the bottom of the pond. So we'll come back to talking about some of these. I may use some of these terms. Um, the other one we say, I don't think I have on this slide, is dissolved oxygen. Really important. And we often just shorthand call that DO. Um, so you may hear me say the word DO. Uh, and know that I'm talking about dissolved oxygen. All right, so what is integrated pest management? Now, I assume if you joined this call, you probably know, uh, but let's just go over some of the ways I've heard it described and, and let's try to kind of um, all agree on our term. Um, I rely on uh, UC Davis mostly. So a lot of times I hear it misused um, and that's, um, when people just say, well, it just means using the least amount of chemicals possible by doing other things first. Uh, that's, I think that's, that's partly right. Um, that includes the four categories or tactics of pest management. That's cultural, biological, physical, lastly, chemical. So typically we say we're going to do cultural controls like manipulating the habitat, making the habitat not conducive to the establishment, of pests. Biological might be predators, competitors. Um, I, I come to this from the agricultural world. So thinking about a pest in a field, um, how do we how do we prevent the pest? How do we make the, the site less conducive to the pest? Um, you know, is it irrigation practices? Is it spacing and planting types? Is it adding other plants that they don't like the smell of or whatever it might be, biological might be, you know, introducing wasps, nematodes, predators, other other insects, parasites. Um, physical, of course, is getting out there and physically removing pests. And then the chemical, as we all know, is applying pesticides, insecticides, et cetera. So a lot of times you'll see companies talk about, oh, we do an IPM approach. And, and but what I would say is that IPM is actually, it's a systematic and scientific approach to pest management. It starts with identification. It starts then monitoring, assessing that pest. When do we decide we're gonna do something about it? What is that threshold for management? What's too much of the pest? What's an acceptable amount? What's a natural, normal amount? Then, we get into actually implementing tactics, whether those are the chemical 
physical, cultural, mechanical, or biological. And then most importantly, and often I would say I see least practiced is a true evaluation and assessment of what you've done. And thereby being able to modify your approach, modify whether it's the threshold for treatment or if it's the um, tactic you're using. Um, we, we say in like the, the landscape management world, I hear the term spray and pray. Um, you know, oh, well, I read you can use this product. Let's go dump it at the maximum rate and then move on. And uh, if it doesn't work, we'll come back and do it again next month. You know, so um, let's put all this together. What does it really mean? What it, I would argue, IPM is all of these things you see. And I say that it's not about eliminating the pest you see right now, but it's about looking at the environmental factors that affect the pest, its ability to thrive, get established. And then how do we use a systematic approach to make modifications to our management practices, to the land or the site in a way to manage that pest, not eradicate the pest or eliminate the pest, um, but typically to live with the pest in a way that isn't harmful to humans, to health to crops, to property, et cetera. So some of you guys may be looking at this going, yeah, 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 I know, I know. But uh, I do think it's important for us to all be on the same page. And when I talk about IPM, I'm thinking about not just the evaluation and the systematic approach, but manipulating the habitat. So I think that tactics, strategy, and philosophy are kind of a good way. Um, philosophy might be the wrong word, but um, this is a good way to think about IPM. So integrated pest management, kind of a summary. If you wanna take a picture of this slide or screenshot it, uh, this is, uh, um, I feel like two really good visualizations of of um, what we just were talking about and describing in IPM. I'll give it another quick second before I move on. Whoop, sorry. So um, I can't tell you how often I hear this quote. It never looked like this before. Um, and now that we're all experts in eutrophication, we're going to answer this question by saying, well, yeah, of course. It's never looked like this before because your lake is aging. It's becoming more eutrophic. And in our industry, we actually have a tool that we use to classify a lake by how eutrophic, how old it is. There's a few ways we can do it but essentially we call it the trophic state index. And there's several different indexes that exist. The most common one is the Carl is Carlson's trophic state index. Uh, Dr. Carlson invented this in the late seventies. And essentially what he's done is he looked at some of the key constituents in the water that we can, that we can measure. And then he created um, some formulas, simple formulas, where you take the results of your water sample and it turns it into this number here, the TSI, the trophic state index, which ranges really from about 40 to 100. You can exceed 100 and you can be lower than 40, lower than 40. Um, and as you can see in the shading coloration, the higher the trophic state index, the greener your lake becomes. The more plants and algae will be present. Um, and you can see the pictures at the top are also representing that transition. You've got Lake Tahoe on the left. We call that an oligotrophic lake. If you were to measure the nutrient concentration in Lake Tahoe, it would be very, very low. As a result, though, should be noted 
you also don't get a lot of fish. There's just not a lot going on in the food chain. You don't have tons of critters and clams and insects. You don't have a lot of algae. And so the food chain is limited. The productivity of the lake is lower in an oligotrophic setting. It's not that you won't get fish, but if you compare that to the next picture, which is Clear Lake, which is never anything other than anything, anything close to clear. Uh, it's like, it's like Greenland, right? It's not very green. Uh, so Clear Lake, which is not clear, um, is a eutrophic, even hyper eutrophic lake, incredibly high amount of nutrients. And you may have read about it, visited it, don't go in late summer. And there are times when the algae mats are a foot thick and miles, square miles of algae out there. So hyper eutrophic. Now, again, as I mentioned, eventually all lakes will transition and just fill in. And they will just be uh, cattails, bulrushes, reeds, emergent vegetation from the shoreline will just kind of march its way year after year out further into the lake. Uh, and then eventually completely fill in that basin. I did mention there are some exceptions, and Clear Lake actually is one of them. Clear Lake uh, has a unique tectonic feature, which is subsidence. And so even though nutrients and sediment are washing in, the basin actually is sinking. And so as it's filling in, it's sinking. And that's been happening for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. And so if that wasn't the case, that lake would have been gone a long time ago. But it's basically maintaining its depth to some degree uh, because of something called isostasy, which is you can um, which has to do with basically the plate going down and the subsidence of the bottom of the lake. It's obviously barely measurable year to year, but um, over time. Uh, and unfortunately, that has allowed, you know, hundreds of feet of mud and debris to accumulate uh, that's very high in phosphorus primarily. So where do you start? if you're gonna be managing pests in a water body. We now know some of the basic fundamentals uh, in general about ecology of a lake and some of the, some of the key things we'll need to be thinking about. <clears throat> um, but where do you start? If you signed up to participate in this, you very well may have a site in mind. Um, so let's start thinking about that. You can't manage what you don't measure um, we like to say at our company, um, if you're not mapping, you're not managing. And so the first thing is, again, another fancy science term, the morphology of a lake. It, it really just means the shape, the depth, the maximum depth, average depth, uh, and ultimately volume, right? We're dealing with a three-dimensional site. And if we're going to be utilizing products or designing and implementing different infrastructure, we need to understand the volume of the water. That is key. Uh, I was just at a site not long ago where a client had no idea, even the, even the surface area. And they told, uh, they hired a person to spray a chemical and they told them literally about 10 times higher um, they said they had a three and a half acre lake. It was a quarter acre pond. Um, and this person then was hired. They came out um, and they applied, you know, a gallon and a half of product. That lake should have had a pint of product. And it killed everything in the lake. And the lake, seven months later, has still not recovered. Uh, volume is key. And we'll talk a little bit about how you can determine that. The next one is looking at that trophic state. Is the lake experiencing eutrophication? Yes, but how much, how fast? What are the things that are contributing to that and can we control those? So where do we stand? Where are we now 
with phosphorus, nitrogen, algae concentration. Where do we stand now? Weed ID, algae ID, obviously key to IPM. Uh, I cannot tell you how often I hear common names um, and uncommon names, um, but I get called a lot. We've got some moss growing. Well, moss, you know, that's a specific organism. What do they mean, moss? Are we talking about algae? Is it a plant? Um, so it's never moss, I'll tell you that. No one actually has moss problems. <laughs> so, but I hear it all the time. So let's talk a little bit about pest ID. Uh, this also goes for mosquitoes versus midge flies. I hear a lot of confusion there. Um, and then lastly, what are we using this water for? What is the beneficial use, right? Um, are we irrigating with it or is it for drinking water? Is it purely aesthetic? Um, this is going to inform our management tactics, but also if we're going to have to rely on chemicals, which chemicals are allowable, appropriate? Um, so let's let's do some mapping here this is google maps you right click you can click measure distance and then you outline your pond here if you've ever done this it's really simple at the bottom then it's going to show you the surface area well forty-three thousand five hundred and sixty square feet in an acre so we can divide that square footage we end up this particular reservoir is 17 and a half acres now, how do we figure out volume and depth? Well, the best thing to do is to go out there and check it out. Um, you can do it with a rope and a weight, and you can measure it. Uh, you can use a sonar device. Uh, you can use a handheld uh, device of some sort. So there's a lot of ways to do it. Believe it or not, what's most commonly done um, is actually to go out and figure out your maximum depth let's call it 20 feet in this situation. And what you can actually do, and textbooks even say it, is uh, you basically divide that by two, and that gives you your average depth. It's close enough usually. And then you multiply area by average depth, and you now have a volume. Um, obviously, you can do much better than this. But uh, I think the term is like close enough for horseshoes or hand grenades. So it depends what you're trying to accomplish. We try to do much better than this. The reason this works is generally speaking, people can classify the shape as roughly a bowl shape. And so that's why that math does get you pretty close. What's a better way? This is a $700 fish finder. You can hit record and you can drive around the lake and it's going to give you a CSV file of X, Y, latitude, longitude, and Z depth. And you can then use online tools. If you are a GIS person or have a GIS department, um, there are tools designed to then convert those points into what you see here. Um, this is a program I use regularly called Biobase. I literally can record my data from a pretty much a conventional uh, chart plotter, fish finder, and I can upload that data. And within an hour or two, I can get back a map like this. And then I can figure out volumes and average depth and max depth and everything right from these maps. So understanding your volume is step one, shape, volume, depth. The next one, we talked about that littoral zone. Uh, that's understanding. Now we're starting to think about, let's go find the pests that are causing me problems. In the case of mosquitoes, they, you know, emergent vegetation, floating vegetation that's rooted, those things may cause stagnant water bodies, stagnant pockets. Let's go identify those those contributing factors, the pests, if you will, in that situation are the mosquitoes. But if it's cattails and rushes and reeds or lily pads that are causing stagnant water, then um, you know maybe maybe the plants are the pests or at least a contributing component. 
Um, so we'll talk about a few pest IDs now. Emergent vegetation is anything that's basically rooted in the shallows on the shore or in the water, but grows up and out of the water. Bulrush, these are tulies. Um, we have a fancy little saying, you may have heard it. Um, sedges have edges, rushes are round, and grasses have blades that bend to the ground. And understanding, are you dealing with a sedge, a rush, or a grass? And understanding the life cycles of those species will inform a lot of your management tactics. Uh, so I'll just mention bulrushes are tulies. Cattails are technically not tulies. Um, the California tule, people typically say I have tulies. Well, we've got a we've got um, two very different species of plant here. And the management tactics and the timing are going to be different. Um, I'm going to get through this pest ID and then maybe we'll take a quick break um, and get some questions. Um, the other type of emergent vegetation, primarily we have in California, a lot of parrot's feather. Um, creeping water primrose is probably even more common. It has little yellow buttercup flowers, four petals. Alligator weed, less common, uh, little white flowers. But these kind of start on shore and creep out into a pond, and they will cover an entire pond uh, over time. When we get into submerged plants, submersed plants, there are lots of different types. Here you see some pretty common ones we deal with. Elodea, it is a monocot. Monocotyledon is the term for us plant people. Uh, that means when it uh, when it sprouts from its seed, it has one leaf, monocot cotyledon, uh, as opposed to a dicot, a dicotyledon. <laughs> so you ever remember back to like high school when we had to plant beans in uh, like a paper towel or in a cup and it sprouts and the bean splits and there's two weird funny looking leaves? Those are cotyledons. So some plants have one cotyledon, the bean plant, two cotyledons. Um, and ultimately, that is probably like step one in understanding how you're going to address these plants and treat them, especially if you're going to be using chemicals. Some chemicals don't affect monocots and only affect dicots or vice versa. So plant ID and understanding is it a monocot or a dicot is key. We'll take a look at that final picture. That looks like a plant to me but it's not, it's algae. Uh, when people send me pictures, I tell them I need you to pick up the plant, hold it in your hand and take a close up picture. Because typically I'll get a picture of someone standing on a dock from 10 feet away of some blob in the water. And they'll say, can you tell me what this is? What do I gotta do? And I'm like, you know, look at, look at these pictures. It could be any of those things. Uh, and so I can't, I'm not gonna be able to typically give you an answer unless you, really want to do the nice thing, you put it on a nice white piece of paper or on the hood of your truck or something and text me a picture. Uh, my, my, uh, my, my phone number is listed on the last page and I'm happy to um, reply. So there are lots of different similar looking species to these two. Some are noxious, some are invasive, some are just a nuisance. Um, some totally native, look almost identical. You can see here that's water milfoil, big problem in lots of places in California. Here's coontail, really difficult to distinguish. One's a diquat, one's a monocot. Um, coontail um, can cause a lot of headaches, but native plant actually provides a lot of value. Stinkwort there, it's called chara, it's commonly called. It's a macro algae. Um, it is not a plant. It's an algae, very different needs. That is often a desirable species that people will even try to seed or move around and put into lakes. Um, it has a kind of a garlicky smell and it's kind of crispy feel and it actually will help clarify water. It really like draws in water hardness elements, calcium, iron metals and things and creates kind of a crusty shell which makes it very hard to treat it with anything uh, but it also really does um, have a lot of benefits. Um, you got to be really careful if you're going to try to transport or move any organism from one pond to another. 
because um you know if you grab a handful of this char you're gonna find snails and clams and worms and all kinds of stuff in there so you got to be pretty cautious if you're going to be doing any transportation uh, and there are protocols for that so this is a picture of a big baddie chemical this is 240 uh it's a restricted use chemical in california this particular product you're seeing on your screen is illegal in california uh i find it everywhere uh golf courses uh homeowners people buy this stuff online you know you can buy it on amazon and ship it to your house uh it is not legal for use in california why do people use it because you go online and you see a really pretty before and after picture about how great it is um, and is it effective yes it is 24d 24d kills dicots dicotyledon plants broadleaf plants farmers use it a lot to kill weeds growing in and around uh, uh, their their crops so broadleaf plants not grasses well what ends up happening the person who buys this online doesn't know that typically maybe doesn't even know what a dicot dicot is or anybody who's worked with chemicals knows that the label is also 27 pages long <laughs> and they're not going to maybe go to the section and read the 500 different plants that are susceptible so what happens somebody buys these pellets they toss them off their shore around their dock it doesn't do anything so what do you do you dump the rest of the bag right and this is common i see this a lot pest id is vital here's another pest anybody recognize this one i don't get to hear you guys talking so i'm gonna assume you all said algae but some of you knew that it wasn't algae it's duckweed actually a fern those are little fronds they have little teeny roots they can double in their growth rate every uh, three to five days uh, it could be water meal could be azola all little teeny floating plants water meals this the the middle one there world's smallest flowering plant then of course we have algaes macro algaes which were the chara i talked about i mean kelp is technically a macro algae seaweeds macro algae um, then you have the filamentous mat forming hairy stuff and you have planktonic algae too single celled organisms typically tint the water green when they bloom into high concentrations they can form kind of clumps or colonies on the surface scums on the surface um, those are typically also can be the cyanobacterial species which are technically a bacteria not an algae but we call them blue green algae they're a photosynthesizing bacteria and then we've got kind of your vectors uh, of disease uh, which would be mosquitoes on the left um, they have a larval state, a pupil state, and the adult state. Understanding, you know, we've probably all seen mosquito larvae kind of stuck at the surface, floating at the surface of a lake. Um, people buy mosquito fish. Mosquito fish are predators that scoot around at the top of a lake and will eat mosquito larvae, hence the name. Um, they are easily confused for midge flies and midge flies spend most of their larval states in the mud as bloodworms which we buy at the pet store and feed to our fish um, if you put mosquito fish in a pond they're predators and they're cruising around at the top they're not going to actually have pretty much any real impact on midge flies midge flies live in the mud so you need to get a different organism like a carp type of species uh, basically a, some sort of fish whose mouth parts are on the bottom not up at the top so if you actually look at the fish you could tell this is a bottom scavenger those things will be eating those red worms from the mud whereas mosquito fish are just going to be cruising around up at the surface looking for looking for small zooplankton and insects to eat so where do we start you start with understanding your pest and understanding the factors that are 
allowing it to thrive. So before I jump into this, um, let's see if there's any questions, any hands going up um, for our pest ID. There is a question that someone yeah. put in the chat. Um, yeah. It's about uh, the volume estimates you were talking about. So the question is, do mosquito, mosquito vector control districts often have the volume estimates for large public water bodies where applications occur? I'm going to say that typically nobody ever does. <laughs> it's honestly so... Uh, frustrating to me. I, I went to work with a very well-known uh, water district the other day, and they had a map like hand drawn from 1960. <laughs> so, and you know, this is like a major water feature. Um, so, <clears throat> um, the answer is the answer is typically no. But what? One thing that will happen in, especially with a vector control agency, is they're going to have some pretty good guidelines, rules of thumb that are going to allow them to do their job effectively. For example, they're going to look at that littoral zone. They're going to be able to see that it's X feet long by X feet wide, and it's about X feet deep. So essentially draw a little three-dimensional triangle or wedge, and you can then calculate that volume, right? It's the shoreline, the littoral zone, that area where they're treating, they're gonna they're gonna do their due diligence to calculate out the appropriate application rates if they're using some sorts of chemicals um, or biologicals to um, to address those vectors, um, and uh, and and a lot of pest control will do the spot treatment type calculations. So it's something you'll do on the fly, and that number may change with the rainy season. Right now, those shorelines are changing. Um, so the rain is coming down, the lake levels are going up, the littoral zone is changing. Where it was very low this last, at the, this time of year, but as we come into the rainy season, lakes are at their lowest levels. Um, so that littoral zone is now shifting and moving. Um, the rain also washes in sediments and scours, and so pond morphology is going to change every year, too, in a lot of places. So, um, <clears throat> so looking at that, uh, moving into the next step, um, how are we doing on, on time? We still have a half hour to go, right? Okay. Yeah, still about 30 minutes. Yeah, okay. So now let's actually start talking about some of the tools and tactics. Um, I know that's a lot of background we've gone through so far. But like I said, I think that providing that background is gonna help you guys think think differently about pests and how we address them. So when we're dealing with pests, typically we're talking about algae and plants. I know we did just talk about kind of insects uh, just now, um, but I focus and typically my calls are algae um, and then following algae, it's invasive plants. So the things that we're going to focus on are nutrients, light, and heat. Those are the things that allow those pests to thrive, the habitat as well. So when we start out with looking at the tactics, we've created an IPM program, and we're now going to start utilizing the different tactics, cultural, biological, physical, and then chemical. The number one thing I think that is misunderstood and underrated is utilizing light attenuating dyes, pond dye. They're typically food grade dyes. People think often that you just put them in because they make the water blue and it looks nice, but it's not true. The reason is chlorophyll A, which is the green pigment in plants and algae that can utilize sunlight to power photosynthesis. Well, if you look at the reflectance, this fancy graph you see here shows you which wavelengths of light, visible light, that these pigments in plants and algae like to absorb. So the higher the peak there on that graph, the more of that wavelength of light they're absorbing to power photosynthesis and make sugars and energy, right? So 
pond dye is blue. Algae and plants want about 450 nanometer wavelength of light here. Uh, that means if you shade out the blue light, pond dye reflects back blue. That's why we see blue. And therefore, the blue wavelengths of light don't penetrate as deep into the lake, reducing plant and algae growth. This is an incredibly effective tactic. It's really unfortunate more people don't do it. I often hear people say they're not going to do it because they don't like the color uh, or they don't like the look of it. Now, you can use black. Uh, black includes blue or very dark blues to try to have a more natural color, but it is incredibly cost effective and has very little to no other negative impacts on an environment. So in terms of safe, effective, least intrusive, pond dye is key. Understanding them, you're going to see some marketing material out there. If you do look into pond dye, people talk about which colors and wavelengths they're using in their dye and why it's superior. Um, there, there's some, uh, there's some fancy marketing going on there. Blue wavelength of light, again, the primary driver of growth and blue also penetrates the deepest into water. Whereas when you get into yellows and red, it really doesn't penetrate that deeply, especially in mucky brownish and turbid surface waters. This is a, this is a picture of a, an ocean example here, but um, you know, or, or a big lake here. Excuse me, it's Lake Superior, but um, you know, honestly, I be be thoughtful about researching your dyes and how much money you're paying. Again, it's easy to apply. There's no permitting required for pond dye. There are no licenses required for pond dye. Um, it is not dangerous, other than if you spill it on your sidewalk, you will never get it off. <laughs> and if you spill it on yourself, you will be blue for several days to weeks. Um, so pond dye, a great cultural, I consider it a cultural control tool. Um, some people might consider it physical, but in my opinion, you are uh, manipulating the habitat to make it less conducive to a pest just establish itself. That to me is the definition of cultural control. The key to it though is going to be you don't just do it one time. Um, you're going to want to keep tabs on it. You want to make sure you calculate out the right rate, which is shown here, one gallon to four acre feet or one quart of a concentrated version. Um, and you want to start early in the season before things start to grow. And you want to make sure it stays a similar dark shade throughout the growing season when there's sunlight. Uh, another one is um, benthic barriers. I, I call this aquatic mulching. There are, you know, some people would call this a physical control tactic. Again, if you have actively growing plants and you're smothering them with a tarp, uh, then yeah, that's a physical control tactic. But if you are using these to prevent things from growing, kind of like a soil solarization, if you will, which is a more common and effective approach, um, that's more of a cultural control, similar to mulching, preventing those plants from establishing in the time of year when they would usually sprout. Um, so keeping seeds dormant, letting seeds die, not letting shoots sprout in early spring. The key to this though, um, I've seen it done incorrectly a lot of times, um, they're not meant to be left there all year long. They, you really only need to leave them out there if you time it right, you know, in March or maybe April for a month or two, and then you can remove them or move them around. They do this quite a lot in Lake Tahoe, very successfully. So thinking more about cultural controls, we need to really understand this graphic. It's a fancy term meaning top, middle, bottom epi, thermocline, and hypolimian, but top, middle, bottom. Why is this important? When lakes heat up in the summer, the top becomes less dense, and as water warms up, it becomes less dense, and it floats on the surface, and eventually it actually creates enough of a density difference that we say uh, 
it it thermally stratifies. I, I see there was just a quick question here about how long does the dye last before degrading? Um, so it can be um, one month, two months, three months at most, two months typically, I would say. I would be applying it every month if it was my lake. You start out with a higher dose and then you would put in some maintenance doses. Black pond dye does degrade faster with photodegradation. You also have to keep in mind, um, do you have any dilution? Are you filling with well water? Is there a creek coming in? Are you spilling? Um, so there's a lot of factors that might uh, affect the, um, the degradation rates um, um, of the dye. So, um, but real quick to, to, to finish off this slide uh, then, when a lake thermally stratifies and the top of the lake gets hot, it kind of creates a blanket and then this middle layer forms called the thermocline. And you can see it in this graph. What I've done here is I've taken a sensor that measures oxygen and temperature, the Y axis is depth in the lake, and I lower the sensor down through the water column. And the thermocline is defined by the area where the temperature starts to drastically shift. So you can see there in the blue line that at around three meters, the temperature starts to change that shows us where that thermal density stratification begins and when that happens the lake can't mix the surface waters become isolated from the bottom and therefore the amount of dissolved oxygen the do in the bottom of the lake starts to become depleted and it can't be replenished when it's deep in the lake and so you can see here with the red line representing the amount of oxygen in the lake, it follows that thermocline and below the thermocline, it eventually goes to nothing. This is natural, it's common, um, but because we don't like our lakes to turn eutrophic and green and mucky, uh, we try to avoid letting this happen. So how do we do that? Other than pond dye as a cultural control tactic, I think the most important thing is aeration, which is a funny word because more often than not, we are not actually dissolving oxygen or air into water. We are using air to move and artificially circulate water. Most of the oxygen transfer in water happens where the water is in contact with the atmosphere. And oxygen molecules will reach equilibrium. So the amount of molecules in the air will equal the amount of oxygen molecules in the water at that interface at the surface of a lake. We call that 100% saturation. And more often than not in smaller water bodies and especially recreational sites uh, we are actually trying to circulate and mix a lake to ensure that all of that water from the bottom breaks through that thermal stratification layer where it can have make contact with the atmosphere and oxygen can can homogenize across that boundary so we're going to talk mostly about artificial circulation here other types of aeration are sophisticated and uh, expensive and really only used in much more um, bigger settings. So how do they work? As I mentioned, a lot of times we see these bubble plumes in the water, the big boiling surfaces, and you're releasing bubbles. Very little bit of that gas actually dissolves into the water. It's up to 3% of the gas per foot of rise, which is not a lot. Um, the key here is we need to entrain the water and use the bubbles to physically lift the water from the bottom to the surface. And there's a lot of actual design that goes into that. Um, I see these mis, um, incorrectly installed a lot. And they really only work in water if you're at a minimum of eight feet, ideally 15 feet. Um, and there's most lakes we come across are 10 feet. And, uh, and so these don't really 
work great in shallow water. So what's another alternative? We call it an updraft circulator. Some people look at them as fountains. Um, there are two types of these kind of fountains. There are propeller based, like a boat propeller, and impeller based, like a suction pump. Suction pumps make pretty beautiful fountains. They don't move a lot of water. They're not really an aeration or circulation tool. They are a decorative feature. So if you have a fountain type thing that has a cage on it or a screen on it or a really big pump hanging down, that is not really an effective management tool. But a propeller is significantly more effective at moving large volumes of water. That's why we use propellers on our boats typically, right? We don't, not a lot of jet boats out there. We use propellers to move things around. So same concept utilizing a propeller which takes and sucks water from the bottom and pushes it up um, a, a unit on the on the floating from the top of a pond can suck water from basically move water from eight to ten feet down below it uh, and that moves you know 800 gallons per minute of water which is a lot um, we also have something called downdraft circulators which is essentially what you're looking at there upside down i consider ones that move water horizontally modification to a downdraft circulator but they you know when you're moving water it's not like we're just um you know shooting a, like a squirt gun into the air uh, when we're moving water in a water body it's creating currents and circulation and it's dragging and pulling water from all around so even a small unit moving water pumping water is going to create a lot of movement and circulation in a much broader larger area water movement not just for artificial circulation for oxygen is key, but for mosquito control, uh, they, they, they need stagnant water. Um, cyanobacteria and algae like stagnant water for lots of reasons. So moving water not just doesn't just oxygenate, it also creates a habitat that is gonna be less conducive to a pest establishing. So what are the objectives when you're oxygenating and aerating? Well. It's either complete or partial mixing of the water column, and that's gonna increase aerobic conditions. So that's going to allow um, organisms to populate areas of the pond that maybe they weren't in before. That could be zooplankton that eats grazers, things that eat algae. Maybe they weren't able to access those areas and the algae can thrive and, and multiply in these areas, such as the bottom of ponds where some algae start to grow. Um, so we can increase the zooplankton. We can increase the amount of bio, um, micro, microbes in the pond that are gonna be eating and consuming nutrients by oxygenating and moving water. Um, I think I mentioned in the beginning, if you reduce the amount of oxygen, you get strange chemical reactions that take place where different metals oxidize or reduce. And when that happens, you release phosphorus and nutrients into the water column. So. Uh, if you can reduce that release of nutrients by oxygenating the bottom of a pond through circulation, you can reduce algae growth. Um, so there's other other benefits as well too. Um, uh, but you can, when incorrectly installed, you actually can exacerbate these problems sometimes. Um, so somebody says here they had a fish kill after disturbing sediment during the summer. Do these Fan fountains run a risk of moving nutrients from the bottom into the water column, making nutrients available for algae. Yes, potentially. Uh, absolutely. So sizing them correctly, installing them in the right locations is vital. Yeah. Uh, if you've got a shallow pond, you don't want to be putting out a, hey, it's cat. Hey, cat. I didn't realize that was you answering the question. Call me sometime. Uh, uh, You'd want to size them correctly and install them correctly. So is it a one horsepower, a three horsepower, a five horsepower? Um, yeah, absolutely uh, can be a problem. All right. Um, it's cool. I'm seeing people. I, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So this is an example just to show you, you know, we call this the relative thermal resistance to mixing. If you are going to install one of these bubble plumes, we know very well how much water those things can pump and move, how much energy they're releasing into the water. And you need to understand how strong the stratification is in a lake. 
how much thermal stratification is occurring. And you, there's formulas we use, uh, which will then tell me how much air needs to come out of this bubbler, how many bubblers I need, how close together they need to be for me to adequately break the resistance, that thermal resistance to mixing, RTRM. I cannot tell you how often I see these not installed correctly. Um, people buy them online. They look it up and it says, oh, you have a one acre pond. You're going to need a four diffuser system. Go go right now to the pond guy or ponds are us and look up aeration systems. They're going to tell you based on the surface area of your pond, how many diffusers you need. That could not be further from the truth. Um, it, I understand why they do it. They need to give people some sort of tool to, to make a decision on what they need. But if you're really serious about aerating, you need to map it and you need to do some calculations to make sure you're not actually just making the problem worse. There are fancier other devices that suck water out of the pond, dissolve gas into the water and put that water back. These are much more sophisticated, require a lot more understanding of oxygen demand, um, flow rates and things like that. Um, so we're not gonna go too much into these really. There are a lot of different methods to do it. Uh, there was a new company called Moliere. They made nano bubbles. I actually went to work with them. Uh, they were a startup. Um, and uh, I will just say I left shortly after starting. <laughs> um, that technology is emerging. It may become a viable tool in surface water management. Um, I would caution you uh, if you are interested in looking at these emerging technologies to just understand that there are lots of variables that they are, are still learning how to account for. And, um, you know, being an early adopter uh, is great, um, but not without um, a lot of risk. <laughs> so here's some examples of what some of these devices look like. Obviously, these look expensive, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, if you got $80,000 or 100000 or a million dollars, depending on the size of your site, these may be a great tool. They're really helpful if you have to maintain cold water. Uh, maybe regulatory wise, you're, you have to release water into a creek. Um, maybe you want to have cold water fish species like trout and you want to keep them happy and alive then these are the type of tools you're going to need. Um, maybe you have a lake that's super duper deep, over 50, 60 feet deep, and the diffused bubbles just aren't going to be a suitable solution in deep water. Then you may have to start looking at some of these other more sophisticated devices. The objectives of these are pretty similar, right? You're going to be increasing that oxygen rate meeting the oxygen demand of the critters at the bottom, which allow them to keep up with decomposition and utilizing nutrients, uh, preventing that nutrient from being released from the sediment by meeting chemical oxygen demand, preventing metals and things from dissolving back into the water. Um, you know, we could do a whole presentation about the oxidation processes, the redox ladder at the bottom of the lake and what's happening but I'll simplify it just to say that when oxygen is not present at the bottom of the lake, um, bad things get released from the sediment. Hydrogen sulfide gas, things that make funny smells, nutrients that make algae grow. Um, that will be a uh, topic two or three at a future date. So what do you do about nutrients, right? We've been able to manage light. We've been able to manipulate the habitat. What about the nutrients? Well. In drinking water, we have a lot of tools. We use aluminum sulfate. We use it in our drinking water all the time. Yeah, I like to think of them as little magnets. You take aluminum sulfate, aluminum chlorohydrate. Some people call them trivalent metals. Lanthanum is a big one uh, commonly used or polymers. And what they do is they will bind with things in the water, primarily phosphorus is what we're interested in. And each one of these chemicals I mentioned has different pros and cons. Uh, there are, you, you do want to get a comfort letter from the water board if you're going to do this. Uh, you want to make sure you're doing it right. 
getting a trained professional. Um, this isn't something you're gonna, <clears throat> preferably you're not gonna buy it at the pool supply store and go dumping it off your dock in your lake. Um, there can be drawbacks. They can manipulate pH, they can harm organisms potentially. Um, they do not cause Alzheimer's disease. I hear this a lot. Uh, there was fear that aluminum causes Alzheimer's. Uh, if you go to the like American Alzheimer's Association, they actually have released um, comments that there is no link between aluminum. There was, I think, one study and it was sensationalized in the news, um, but um, there is there is no scientific link. Um, and uh, aluminum chlorohydrate is a common one we use. Uh, that's in all of our deodorants right now under our arms, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we use it in our drinking water all the time. So what does it do? It binds with phosphorus and it settles it to the bottom. That phosphorus is bound to the aluminum. Some people use iron. Some people use lanthanum, which is a rare earth element. What, uh, the product is Foslock. Um, and those are really, really helpful and a great way to reduce nutrients quickly. And you can actually make really fast, quick improvement to a lake by eliminating, reducing phosphorus, the limiting nutrient for a lot of pest growth. Um, the next slide we get into is physical controls. So lots of different fancy tools to do this. You could see there the video of a cookie cutter, some people call that. Um, really great at chopping up plants and killing them. Um, you know, you want to put a biologist on the front of that thing to look for, uh, you know, San Francisco endangered garter, garter snakes and Western pond turtles. And uh, it's pretty indiscriminate. And all that stuff is dying and going to the bottom. Not really a great tool but necessary if you have a navigable channel and you got to get a boat through it or you you've got an irrigation canal and your water velocity is hampered and you're potentially going to overtop and bust up a uh, overtop a canal so this is a pretty self-explanatory you know physical removal there are lots of ways hand pulling cutting harvesters suction dredging rotivating Lots of tools, pros and cons to each. Um, the next one we'll just cover briefly is biological control. Adding predators isn't, for an algae and plant, isn't really an option much in California. Tilapia won't survive. It's too cold. Uh, they'll die off in the winter. Um, carp are typically not legal in most places. They are ubiquitous. Uh, but they do eat plants. Um, this is just a theoretical pie chart. The, the truth is, if you look at this pie chart, the bacterial wedge is probably like 99% of the organisms by mass living in your pond and responsible for consuming bacteria, uh, consuming nutrients. Um, but you can add, some people add different plants, desirable plants. Essentially what you're doing is you're manipulating the wedges. If you were to eliminate one of these wedges, for example, getting rid of all the algae, one of those other wedges is gonna grow to fill that void. It's now there's excess nutrients available and it's going to, um, so you're just gonna trade one pest for another often. So uh, it is important to understand that process and you can attempt to augment or increase one wedge. And a lot of people have been starting to use these probiotics for ponds, beneficial bacteria, and I've seen really good results with that. Um, again, you got to be careful and do your research on the, the products. Really look for the people who are um, the original manufacturers of these products, um, people who maybe provide them into aquaculture, into wastewater treatment, um, as opposed to someone who maybe um, may not be a, as regulated of a product. Um, Maybe it's maybe it's just barley straw or something or, or marketing material. So there are no regulations. There's no permits on those. They're not a chemical. They don't kill anything. Uh, what you're doing is you're adding organisms that are going to be competing and eating nutrients. Some people like to put crawdads in ponds. That 
there's risks to that and there's a lot of invasive crawdad species um the bacteria i think um kind of kind of a misunderstood there's a lot of research on using them in wastewater and aquaculture and there's a lot of research about it in oceanography and it's never really been applied to limnology this is from um this is from a, a peer-reviewed paper in um in limnology believe it or not which is like the only one i could find <laughs> but what it's showing here is in the middle there you see that that circular thing they call that the microbial loop and basically what you're having is the bacteria are using nitrogen and phosphorus and they're ultimately getting consumed and brought into the food chain um and usually when we think of the food chain we kind of go down to autotrophs which are algae and plants and we think of that as the bottom of the food chain um and but there is this kind of adjacent bottom which is bacteria um the last step we'd get into here but i think we're running are we are we out of time we're not totally out of time but maybe you can wrap it up in the next three to four minutes yep so the next time for questions well the last step in IPM here um, is the chemical approach. Um, there are over 300 different chemicals that we can can uh, access if we are a, a vegetation management professional. They are grouped into 27 modes of action. But in the aquatic world, we actually only have 17 active ingredients. And in California, we have even less. We have 14 active ingredients. And they can really only be grouped into 10 modes of action. Um, so if we actually, these are all the chemical names, but we can break them down here. There's contact transitionals, which are these um, kind of plant growth regulators, 2,4-D, triclopyr, which is Renovate or Garlon, and then the systemics. And understanding what you're trying to treat, what is the pest, understanding what is that water used for, will help you determine which one of these products is best to be used, how often to use it, how much to use, uh, and how you might you leverage this in conjunction with some of those other things. Um, I'm going to skip through this slide, which gets a little nuanced about the specifics, but I want to get to this. Dissolved oxygen. Plants and algae, trees, think trees, they take in carbon dioxide and they make oxygen. Oxygen in the water body comes from that surface interaction with the atmosphere, but it also comes from the plants and algae. In fact, probably 60% or more of the oxygen in your lake comes from plants and algae. So if you kill these plants with a chemical, they are going to be eliminating the organisms that make oxygen. Those plants and algae are going to die, sink to the bottom, and start to decompose, where microbes are going to eat them, and they are going to consume oxygen. So you have now removed the source of oxygen and increased the demand of oxygen. So I often hear people say about chemicals that it sucks the oxygen out of the water, and that's what kills the plants. That's not true. Plants don't really need oxygen per se, they make oxygen. The way that we get this is that if you look at the chemical labels, I assume when you see uh, these language in the chemical, in the labels of the chemicals, they typically will address and talk about oxygen. And um, basically what they're talking about here is the rapid die off and the increase in demand for oxygen will deplete the oxygen and can result in fish kills. Uh, the chemicals themselves do not affect oxygen. But if you over treat a pond or try to treat an entire pond all at once, you'll often deplete oxygen to the point where you can harm other non target organisms. So it's important to know what you're applying and to apply it according to the label. We often, we almost never treat an entire pest all at once, primarily for this reason. So I could go into some more uh, stuff, but I think I will keep it at that. Um, 
other to say that timing is key with chemicals. Um, that was, uh, I guess I added too many slides in the end, Shoba. I, <laughs> I didn't expect it to go on that long. Um, but uh, if you've got my contact info here, uh, Eli at laketech.com. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about the presentation. Um, you can scan the, uh, scan the QR code at the top for my contact card, um, laketech.com. Um, happy to chat with folks.